Good evening. Uh, welcome to this St. Mary's University webinar on prisons and punishment in the 21st century. We're delighted to be holding this event in association with our friends from Caritas Social Action Network and the Bishops Conference of England and Wales. I wanted to hold an event like this because there is so much talk about COVID-19 to the exclusion of other public policy issues at the moment. But even when we do discuss the post-COVID future in relation to questions such as social care and missed educational opportunities, the 84,000 people who are in prison and those who work and volunteer in prisons are ignored. I wanted to do a little bit to raise the profile of the challenges we face in our criminal justice system to which we should be very alert as Christians. Just a little word about St. Mary's. We are the UK's largest Catholic university with five and a half thousand students. And according to the surveys, we have some of the country's most satisfied students, which reflects the ethos of our wonderful staff. We'll put a bit more um, information in the chat function about the university later in the evening. Thank you in advance to our special guests, the Reverend Jonathan Aitkin and Bishop Richard Moff. I shall introduce them uh, in a moment. I'd like to bid a special welcome to those who are joining us from local Catholic parishes and other Christian communities locally. This is the first time we've reached out systematically to our friends in our geographically closest 50 Christian communities, but it will not be the last. St. Mary's University aspires to be a leading Catholic university internationally. However, we are also conscious that we are embedded within our local community and that we have a mission to promote the common good within that community in the unique way proper to universities. Indeed, we think that about 50% of our students live locally and many, many more undertake business, charitable and school placements locally. So over the next two or three years, we really want to build up these relationships. So finally, I'm delighted to introduce our special guests tonight. Jonathan Aitken has had at least three careers, each of which individually would normally satisfy even the most ambitious. He was author of the award-winning biography of Richard Nixon. He served in the cabinet in the John Major government of the, uh, of the early 1990s. And then most recently, he's been an Anglican vicar. Um, as is widely known, after serving in Her Majesty's government, uh, uh, Jonathan served at Her Majesty's pleasure for seven months um, in, in prison. Uh, but this was a life-changing experience in a positive uh, way, as his later career shows. And we may hear a little bit more uh, about that um, during the discussion. Bishop Richard Moth was born in Zambia. Um, his family came to England where he grew up and then entered the priesthood in 1982. Bishop Richard is a trained canon lawyer qualifying in Ottawa. He was then appointed Bishop of the Armed Forces in 2009 and Bishop of Arundel and Brighton in 2015. We're also delighted that Bishop Richard chairs our university governing body and he leads for the Catholic Bishops Conference of England and Wales um, on prisons. So Jonathan, I'd, I'd like to start by putting a very practical question to you really based on your um, uh, uh, knowledge, which I mentioned earlier. We'll talk about Christian mission in prison um, later. Um, but I want to talk about, if you like, slightly more down-to-earth um, issues first. Of course, there is good in all of us, but to what extent is there an observable innate goodness and basic decency amongst those in prison? Or is life just extremely hard and brutal? Jonathan. Prison is complicated in its mixture. Um, and as you mentioned, of had sort of both a worm's eye view and a bird's eye view of prison. I've been a prisoner and I'm now serving prison chaplain. And a phrase which very often goes through my mind is a familiar one, there but for the grace of God go I, or my case went I. Um, and of course, um, people are in prison for a reason. Um, they've been punished by the state for something they have done wrong. And there's no getting away from that. But do you find in the unhappiness of prison uh, all kinds of golden seams of decency, goodness, um, helpfulness, kindness? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the, all those things flow through a prison, uh, sometimes in the most unexpected places and from the most unexpected people. So I am the very last person to rush to judgment uh, on 
any kind of generalized basis on prisons and prisoners. And I would certainly say time and again, and interesting that we might talk about this in a moment, the COVID crisis has brought some of this out. There's a lot of goodness, despite the, the, being a population of people who have done bad things. Thank you. Okay. So, so Bishop Richard, I'd like to ask you particularly about the impact of COVID uh, on prisons. We haven't heard a great deal about it in, in, in the news, but I have to say what I have heard um, it, it is not that great. How has it affected the welfare of prisoners and staff? If I could come at this from two angles. First of all, to pick up on something Jonathan said, um, which is that within prison communities, there is so much care shown um, one uh, prisoner to another. And it, you know, for a long, long time now, um, people in our prison communities have been uh, given the opportunity and uh, some training to keep an eye on particularly vulnerable um, people around them. Um, uh, kind of on a Samaritan's kind of model, They're often called listeners in prison. And they're a presence to people who are feeling very vulnerable. So there's that thread of care for the other and indeed encouragement and facilitation to make that effective and, and perhaps even a little bit professional in one sense. So I think that is certainly showing itself in the COVID circumstance. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing and, and hugely positive. The difficulty I think that prison um, population is facing at the moment through COVID um, arises very often because of the impact on staffing. So if you have a number of staff in your prison who are having to self-isolate for whatever reason, either because they've got relatives who are unwell or they themselves have to self-isolate because of a positive test, that reduces your staffing level. As the staffing level reduces, the possibilities for um, the people for whom they're caring, leaving the cell, going to work, having education classes, accessing all the possibilities that there are in prison, they shrink and that's that's a, a very difficult impact on on the prison population if i can just give you one example i was in a prison in our own diocese here just a few weeks ago to baptize and confirm uh, one of the men there um it was myself one of the chaplains and the man i was baptizing and that was it just the three of us in the chapel uh, it was a lovely, quiet, prayerful celebration, very special for the three of us, um, but just not possible to have anybody else there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, certainly COVID is having an impact and it's a negative one. Um, lots of positives amongst the, the prison population coming out of this, um, but the impact is great. And it means that in some prisons, and the, this picture is not universal, but in some prisons, um, people are locked up for much longer hours, especially over weekends when the prison staffing is lower anyway. Um, access to chaplaincy services, to times of prayer, to the normal Sunday services that people can come to. In some prisons, that's not just not happened for over a year. Mm -hmm. um, so the impact is great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Reverend Jonathan, moving on from um, uh, prison, or, or rather staying with prison chaplaincy, um, your, your life obviously changed. Um, it, it was changed by the time you were in prison and you became a committed uh, Christian. Can you tell us something about how Christian chaplains and visitors bring hope into prison communities? I, I mean, how, how often is it that a prisoner will um, find uh, God in the apparent darkness uh, of that institution and, and be converted to Christianity? Well, I can indeed, and really that's what prison chaplains try and do every day. But just for answering, Paul, can I just pick up on the last question because it's so important. Bishop Richard is right. But just to put some uh, little bit of extra detail, um, the staffing, as he referred to, has been seriously hit. Pentagon um, I served the first week of when the COVID epidemic was breaking, two prison officers, much respected, died, and over 150 of the 450 staff were off sick, um, either physically or, or um, 
uh, taking precautions because of they've come into contact. Now you can tell at once what enormous impact that would make. And COVID is hitting, for instance, in all kinds of linked ways. Uh, for example, the adjective overcrowded is one often applied to prisons. Social distancing, never been heard of in any prison. So it, it, and it certainly hasn't worked. And yet, and yet, and yet, um, once we sort of started to get disciplined, um, actually, in certain Penville and some other prisons, have been very successful at um, containing the disease. And one of the reasons we've been successful is that the prisoners themselves, who you might think would be extraordinarily upset at having to be kept in their cells, in many cases, for 23 hours a day, um, you'd think that that would as it has done in the past, send people to what is called stir crazy and lead to all kinds of bad behavior. Absolutely the reverse. Um, I can only speak with assurance from Penderville, but the number of good examples of good neighborliness, understanding, cooperation, um, Penderville has actually done well under the pandemic. And it wouldn't have done so if it hadn't been for the prisoners cooperating with real wholehearted uh, hope and, and enthusiasm. Now the chaplaincy has played its part in that, and I come to really your main question. Um, what are chaplains for? They are to bring hope uh, and God's light into a dark place, and it's been quite difficult in the pandemic. And most chapels are completely shut um, and don't have only service at all. We don't. On the other hand, we are extremely energetic as a chaplaincy team. Um, in going around and making pastoral visits on the wings, which are much appreciated. Uh, I was with the Catholic chaplain at Penville this morning. In between us, we handed out uh, something like 18 rosaries to people who asked for them. Uh, and perhaps that's an example of how in that this dark time, in this dark place, um, there is a spiritual hunger, which, of course, the chaplain does his best, her best to answer very often praying with prisoners, a great deal of that goes on, uh, just simply talking and listening. Uh, another COVID-related problem which needs to be highlighted in a most welcome webinar like this is that uh, the waiting time to have cases heard has shot up because of COVID because courts are closed in large numbers. And uh, last time last year, the waiting time between being arrested and remanded in custody in Pentonville was about three or four months. Unbelievably, I met this morning three people whose cases are not going to be heard, they're still innocent, remember, until late 2022. Um, so justice denied is just, justice delayed is justice denied. There's an old saying which has a very painful ring and there are some people who are really frustrated and upset and angry. And one of the things, trying a chaplain to um, persuade people to be patient is not easy. And that's one of many spiritual needs uh, which the chaplain, I mean, pastoral life in a prison is pastoral life may be at its most tough and uh, difficult, but it's a thrilling work to be doing. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I can just say to people that you can start putting questions in Q&A um, at, at, at any time from from now. I'll, we'll, I'll ask you two or three more questions each to Bishop Richard and Reverend Jonathan, but um, if you want to start um, thinking of questions to put into the Q&A, um, please, uh, please do that. Um, just picking up on that, uh, Bishop Richard, would you like to elaborate on anything Jonathan has said? What, what is the sort of thing which might happen on a, on a day which would bring a real sense of satisfaction to a prison chaplain or, or a prison visitor? That's, that's rather a difficult question to answer because I think so much of the ministry of a prison chaplain is deeply satisfying. Um, I, can, I can put it this way though, when one is faced, and I, obviously I, I've not had Jonathan's experience and neither have I been a full-time prison chaplain. I've done a, a bit some work in prisons and uh, I've been doing work nationally, uh, meetings with governments and such on behalf of the church, but um, my experience comes at it from a very, very different angle, and I wouldn't, would never claim to have the depth of experience that Jonathan has. 
But if you put somebody in a situation where really a lot of the props on which they would normally rely are taken away, and your, their life, if you like, is stripped back and simplified, that provides an opportunity for a consideration of big questions. Mm -hmm. And in my experience in prisons, and a year never goes by as a bishop, uh, when uh, in, in a number of prisons in my own diocese, I'm not baptizing and confirming. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so faced with, with, that, with that opportunity to look at the big questions, um, for a lot of people in my experience, that brings people to think about faith. And the chaplain is in this wonderfully privileged position um, if I can express it this way, of walking alongside somebody on that journey. Um, and sometimes it is just walking alongside and not saying very much at all. Mm -hmm. But that accompaniment is so vital so that when the time for the discussion, the conversation arises, the moment when somebody will say, you know, I've heard my auntie's not well, can you pray for them? They know that they've got somebody there on whom they can rely um, who will be there for them at any moment, at any time, in any circumstance. Um, and for the chaplain, that is deeply rewarding, mm -hmm. deeply rewarding. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't frustrations, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like there are in parish life or the life of the military chaplain or whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be. Of course there are, but it's a deeply rewarding ministry. And just if I may, and this is personal experience, of celebrating a Good Friday liturgy in a very large prison um, in South London some years ago when I was Vicar General in Southwark um, and was looking after Holy Week at, um, at Belmarsh, which MP Belmarsh. Um, and my experience of seeing um, the men there on Good Friday at the veneration of the cross and an evident relationship between their experience and what we were remembering on Good Friday, I think mm -hmm. it's, it was, it's, it's one of those moving experiences one has as a priest that's going to stay with me forever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a a deep, deeply um, moving experience for them and, and for me too. So um, yeah, it's, it's a, it, for those called to it, and not everybody mm -hmm. is, but for those who are called to prison ministry, um, it's, it's a deep, deeply rewarding. Mm -hmm. I, I was re reflecting the other day, actually, I, mean, I, I suppose it's obvious in a way that you know, on, on Good Friday, you had somebody who was unjustly on prison, imprisoned, somebody who was a repentant prisoner and somebody who was, um, as far as we know, a, a, a non-repentant prisoner. So I, I, there's, uh, yeah, that, that analogy is, 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 is very close. I'm just staying with you, Bishop Richard. You, you lead for the Bishop's Conference on um, prison policy issues and... Um, a while ago, I think two or three years ago, you, um, the Bishop's Conference published a, um, a document on the reform of, of prison um, policy. We have 84,000 people in prison in, in the UK. That's quite high, very high by European standards and, and indeed even relative to the uh, rate of, of violent crimes, it's very high um, as, as well. What might be done to reduce the prison population? <laughs> Gosh. Uh, how many hours have you got? <laughs> uh, I, I, again, one would want to come at this from a number of angles. Mm -hmm. uh, one can look at it from the point of view of the bigger societal questions, um, because a lot of the, um, the difficulties in life that lead to offending grow out of the problems that people face in society. Um, so there, there's a whole, whole area there. Um, I think one of the difficulties with... with um, with our, with our present um, prison regime uh, is, is slightly historical. So if you look at the way prisons were designed and built 150 years ago, they were built for something rather different to what we expect of our prisons today. So if you build a prison that is designed to separate people from society to lock them up, keep them out of the way, that's not so good when it comes to rehabilitation, just mm -hmm. the physical space, um, the design of the place, all those kinds of issues. 
Now, I think what we're, we're, where we need to, and I'm not suggesting that government policy isn't moving in this direction, but we need to be much clearer about this combination of things that we ask of those whom we commit to prison. One of which is um, uh, the, the accepting a punishment for a crime. So the kind of 19th century view, if you like. Um, but we also need to say, what can we do more effectively to enable people to acquire skills that maybe they didn't have before they came into prison so that when they leave, they can take a, a more fruitful part in society. So there's the whole educational piece. Mm -hmm. um, there's the whole social reform to a system um, to, to come back into society, uh, maybe to circumstances that aren't, that aren't best. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then there's the whole thing of recidivism. How can we help people to develop strategies that will mean that they will, will, will not be coming back into prison, or will not get on the roundabout, mm -hmm. the time in and the time out and the time back in again, which is, is all too common. Um, so somehow all of those things need to be looked at in an estate, in a prison estate, which isn't really designed in most cases for that sort of process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a huge struggle, I think, for, for government. Uh, and and I, I, you know, I don't envy them that, but somehow, uh, we've got to, to change things along those lines. My sense is, and I've written about this, particularly in regards to women's sentencing, um, that we need to develop a combination of things a little bit more than we do at the moment. So to allow for a shorter sentence in prison, um, and I'm not, I'm not talking about people here who've committed such serious crimes that they are a danger to society. So I must be clear about that. But for many people in prison, um, a shorter custodial sentence combined with um, a better monitored, supervised, perhaps with the, with the help of tagging um, outside of prison, uh, to help that rehabilitation, I believe, has to be the way forward. Um, mm -hmm. Now, some prisons, and we've got one in, in my own diocese, um, do wonderful work in enabling prisoners to work and engage and learn trades that they can pick up when they leave. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not universally the case, is my sense. Mm -hmm. So much more work needs to be done there too. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so I'm going on too long, but it's a combination of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a, right. Starting from a circumstance which is not designed for it. That's, that's one of the biggest nuts I think we have to crack. I mean, I've, um, I've not known that many prisoners, but two prisoners that, that, that I have known, or former prisoners, they actually found the period immediately after they were in prison more difficult than the time they were in prison. Um, so they were in so-called protected accommodation surrounded by other ex-offenders, some of whom were quite dangerous, but with absolutely no protection from prison staff. In one case, it was a sex offender and he could attend mass in prison, but he wasn't allowed to attend mass, for example, um, when he uh, uh, left prison. So I, I, I guess you're saying that 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 whole system of how you deal with pr people after they after they leave prison uh, needs serious attention. Yeah, and I, I, sorry, I'm, mm. I think one of the difficulties, is particularly when we're in, when we have a, a, a sentencing policy which imprisons so many people, mm -hmm. um, there is a, a the massive risk of a one size fits all, mm -hmm. uh, and of course a one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Jonathan will know better than I, every person in the prison in which he's a chaplain is a different person. Absolutely. Um, of course, I agree wholeheartedly with virtually everything that Bishop Richard has said. But I, I think the original question was, how do we sort of get fewer people going to prison? And here are some very quick suggestions. Mm. First of all, um, we really need to get our political leaders and commentators into a less punitive and more rehabilitative mindset. Just to give a specific example today, the newspapers are full of headlines saying that the government wants to give those who uh, give wrong information about which country of origin they arrived to at Heathrow Airport, if they tell a lie about it, they're going to get 10-year sentences. Crikey, I said to myself when I read this, 
especially when I was going around the jail this morning talking to, for example, a child rapist who'd been who was in for seven years, an armed robber for five, <clears throat> quite a big drug street dealer for three, um, you know, to have a 10 year sentence for what is in effect, I suppose, a form of perjury, telling a lie on your form. Uh, no perjurer has been sent to jail in the recent memory for longer than four years. So what on earth the House of Commons thinks it's doing, suddenly creating a 10 year sentence. But I'm afraid this kind of knee jerk reaction to a problem, hit it hard with heavier sentences, let's get tougher, is one of the causes where we have too many people in prison. And Bishop Richard touched on two or three very, very important things. Um, on the whole rehabilitative question, we could go a long way if we use modern technology to have tagging <clears throat> uh, forms of house arrest linked to imprisonment. We could do much, much more than we do to have fewer people in prison. Let's remember that well over 80% of people who are in prison are there for crimes which have nothing to do with violence. Uh, and they are there for quite different non-violent reasons. Surely there could be greater scope for um, making non-custodial or semi-custodial senses uh, for them. But above all, let's make rehabilitation work. And of course, Bishop Richard is right to say there are some very dangerous people who should be kept in prison. There are some people who need to be punished in the eyes of society. But the sort of third leg of the tripod, rehabilitation, is very badly and inadequately handled, even though there's some good people doing it, and good charities doing it, not least some very good Catholic charities doing it. So we did a bit of a whole rethink in this area of, could we have fewer people in prison? We certainly could. Can I, can I pick up on, and Jonathan has spoken about this, which is the issue of sentence inflation. So mm. um, I haven't got the figures in front of me on the desk, but Jonathan may have them in his head. But if you look at, um, if you take a crime committed today and the sentence you would get today, and the sentence you would have got 10 or 15 years ago for the same offence, <coughs> the sentence you will get today is longer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, it, I, don't, I believe mm -hmm. that it is not difficult to just stop sentence inflation. Mm -hmm. um, and that, 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 that would be a very important first step. Okay. And, and um, Jonathan, I, I remember when you came out of prison a long time ago now, talking about championing the idea of restorative justice. Um, in, in your experience since then, uh, do you think this has any legs as a potential uh, either alternative to um, penal sentences or, or a complement to them or something which can be done in the rehabilitation period? Well, it does have some legs and it's going well where it does. Northern Ireland, for example, there is a lot of restorative justice. For some reason, uh, Thames Valley Police Area has a lot of restorative justice. And most people haven't a clue what it means. But actually, to really get it, you need to go back to the story of Zacchaeus in the Bible, who was a, a man who was obviously some sort of fraudster and crooked individual. He saw Jesus, came down, and Jesus, um, in front of everybody, Zacchaeus said, I'm so sorry. I will restore um, fourfold, if I'm memory serving, uh, all the money I've swindled out of people. Uh, and so in a very public way, he uh, admitted in front of the people he'd defrauded. Now, restorative justice really gives victims their shout. Often with the um, person who's committed the crime against them present with a skilled arbitrator or conciliator there. And it's not an easy, anyone who's seen that, these are very uh, uh, arduous sessions. <clears throat> but a lot of, you know, for example, burglars frequently think that all they've done is commit a crime against property. And they have no idea, or so they say, until they're confronted with the weeping widow who was terrified at hearing burglars in her house, who was appalled by the destruction they did the excrement they left on her carpet. I was terrorized for weeks afterwards. When you actually get a dialogue between the victim and the perpetrator of the crime, and the perpetrator of the crime starts to realize 
how much damage he may have done over and above, you know, stealing a pair of candlesticks or whatever it was, you might be getting some way towards changing minds in a way which will change people away from the life of crime. Mm -hmm. So I'm a great champion of restorative justice. It's quite difficult to organize, but when it's done, it is actually, all the statistics shows, a very effective tool for re reducing reoffending. And thank you very much. I'll, I'll now move to questions from the audience. We, we've had a, a flood of questions. Um, and I'll, let me start by with David Kerr here, because this is to some extent um, on this issue of, of reintegration of um, people um, after they leave prison. David asks, how might faith communities and parishes assist in the reintegration process for those people who leave prison? Um, perhaps I can ask you that first, Bishop Richard. And, and can you be quite practical? Because sometimes there might be a desire to do something and you know you have a deacon or a priest in a parish or somebody leaving, leading an SVP uh, group and they just don't know what to do in terms of practical um, steps if they want to assist um, ex-offenders. Sure, I think there are a number of very practical things one can do. We had in, um, had it was run jointly with, with, um, with Catholic Social Action Network, um, uh, a road show in the Diocese of Arundel and Brighton, um, bringing together um, a number of different bodies, PACs and others, who assist in uh, this kind of phase of supporting parishes, volunteers into prison. Um, and we had, we had 80 people from the diocese attend this. It was up in Surrey, in one of our Surrey parishes, um, showing people the ways that they can help. Now, some of it can be volunteers going into prison to meet with people there, to assist with Sunday liturgy, to do some visiting, whatever that might be. Um, so people from parishes can be involved in that way. They need to go through some checks and all the usual things, but that's perfectly possible. Um, the other thing is that um, charities like PACT will, will do a lot of work supporting families of um, those who are in prison, because that's a, that's a really key issue. Again, if you're looking at recidivism, if the, if, if the family can be strengthened, as somebody returns to the to the fold, as it were, from, from spending time in prison. Um, so support for families is key and support for, for men and women who are leaving prison. And there are models where a group of people will arrange to meet with somebody for coffee, you know, on a, on a fairly regular basis. They have a Natterin Costa and there's a support network, a, a group of people that somebody knows that, that on Thursday, I'm going to see my friends in Costa Coffee. Um, and we can have a chat and it, it needs to be done carefully um, with clear boundaries and all those kinds of things, obviously, um, and in a professional kind of way, as we would with any form of pastoral work. SVPs and other groups would be well used to following appropriate guidelines for any work that they do. So there are a number of models um, and we need more of them and we need parish communities uh, ready to welcome uh, people who have spent uh, time at Her Majesty's pleasure. Um, and, you know, it's not, not because people want to know, or oh, this, this person has been in prison, what have they done? That's not the issue. But we need welcoming communities. Um, and the more our communities can be places of welcome, um, the more important, you know, the, the, the more effective that will be. You mentioned earlier on the issue of a sex offender. Now, um, with the right measures in place and parishes, a lot of parishes um, across the country uh, will have people who are under safeguarding plans to enable them to attend Mass in a way that's safe for everybody concerned. Um, and uh, safeguarding commissions in dioceses, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the other churches, other faith groups will be well used to facilitating that kind of possibility for people. Um, you don't make a great song and dance about it, it would be very wrong to do that, but those possibilities are there. So there are good models around, absolutely the case. Um, we need more people in our parishes to be ready to come forward to be part of those good, those good models of practice. 
Now, if I can just give an advert for the road show for a minute, use my chancel, I've got one. We had one in Arundel and Brighton uh, and worked pretty well. Um, I thought we'd better go first since I was the Bishop for Prisons, but the plan is that we're going to go around the other 25 dioceses with this road show in due time. COVID has got in the way, um, but they will be running again around the, around the, around the country. And it kind of showcases the possibilities for people to be engaged in this, this very wonderful ministry, really. Yeah. Philip, unmute. No, so I'm, I'm, I'm muted because the dog was being noisy. So, um, oh. <laughs> Jonathan, what about in Anglican parishes? Um, uh, how, how can parishes there help this process of rehabilitation? I think it needs to be recognised looking first of all from the prisoner's point of view, that coming out of prison is often much harder than going into prison. Because when you come out of prison, you're very uncertain as to what kind of a reception you will get, even from your own family, let alone friends, let alone from the church. And there's a feeling the biggest thing that any Anglican or Catholic parish can do is to extend the hand of hope towards an ex-offender. Hope that he might, or she might be uh, not treated like a pariah, but quietly and sensitively welcomed back into the parish community or just into conversations, uh, which needn't, of course, dwell on the uh, offence or the offender. And the biggest area of hope is, I think, is there any hope of getting a job? That's the biggest single type. And actually, an area of hope is that more and more employers do offer second chances for employment. There's a lot of uh, good news around. Um, I'm president of a charity up in Yorkshire run by two ex-prison officers, very tough, rough diamond type former prison officers, both good Catholics, who have done a world of good with their charity. Last year they got 320 uh, prisoners, more or less straight from jail into interviews, job interviews, had a very high success rate once they were interviewed, and a very high success rate in not going back to crime. But the employment scene is something which we should encourage um, to be more uh, prisoner sympathetic, at least to the extent of giving second chance interviews. Mm -hmm. um, but it comes down often to the teachers of the gospel, um, be good neighbours. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, the uh, sheep and the goats parable has a very chilling line when Jesus asked, where were you when I was in prison and you did not visit me? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it is uh, those of us who are who have a Christian faith, Anglican, um, Catholic or any other faith, I think need to respond to the idea that it is our duty to try and extend a helping hand of friendship and hope and good neighbourliness. Mm -hmm. to those who are coming out of prison and seeking to go straight. Thank you. And um, I'm just going to put into the chat with, I, um, I, I'll say this without any, uh, I, I, I just uh, cut and paste something from an article that was in the tablet about an organization uh, which works with people. It's called Circles of Support and Accountability. And um, there's a blog post about it in the tablet. If you just Google tablet rehabilitation prison or something like that. You can see the, the whole article. Um, I'm not able to, uh, whilst to multitask sufficiently to find the right link to put into, um, uh, to put into the chat, but that should give you enough to uh, 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 look out that particular organization um, if it uh, interests uh, people who are listening to this webinar. And the idea there is that those circles of support and accountability um, work with people who leave prison, just providing them with very practical help uh, and accompaniment. Uh, on that journey um, uh, following um, uh, prison. If Bishop Richard knows about the organisation, he may say something about it. Uh, yes, that's, that's the model I was speaking of, Philip, in connection with meeting with people on a weekly basis. That's yeah. what the circle of support does, yeah. really. Okay, yeah. It, it, it's hugely effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. As, you know, I, I would go back to this thing, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Mm. And there is a wonderful community up near Kendall, the Chiracolo community, it's the only one we have in this country. It's something which started in Italy, um, which for the right person uh, is, is a, wonderful, um, a wonderful way of, of 
finding uh, meaning in life. It's a kind of religious community almost and pretty self-supporting. Um, I visited it. It, it. it comes across as being rather strict when you first go there, a little bit daunting. Um, but for those for whom it's right, mm -hmm. uh, it can make all the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need a whole variety of things mm -hmm. um, because, because people, uh, you know, one person uh, uh, will respond better to one possibility than another. It's about, it's about possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just put in a plug for the tablet, uh, which you mentioned just? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, I mean, I avidly read just about everything that's written about prisons, mm -hmm. uh, rehabilitation, and I would award first prize to the tablet for a paper which takes the whole issues we're discussing tonight seriously. Of course, I have to declare an interest. They occasionally ask me to write a book review for them. Mm -hmm. It's really unimportant. The point is that. Uh, it really is a beacon of good journalism in the area of prisons, prisoner rehabilitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so three cheers for the tablet. Thank you. And Marianne's put a link in actually to, to yes. the article now. So that, that's uh, uh, excellent. Um, so one of the questions which has been upvoted a couple of times uh, actually goes really relates to this uh, one size doesn't fit all uh, sort of uh, way of thinking that a lot of people go to prison after suffering childhood trauma or have other vulnerabilities, um, that, uh, that um, not all people who go to prison are bad people. The question says we need to be careful of the language uh, that is used. I'm sure that point is taken, but perhaps we could just extend that further as well. Um, obviously, there are many people in prison who are suffering from uh, drug addiction and so on, which you could say reduces their culpability for the crimes that they have committed. Um, how do we deal with these problems in prison? You know, separating out those who really, um, perhaps their culpability is quite limited because of the experiences, experiences they've had as a child or because they've been caught up in drug addictions or immediately got, um, uh, uh, when they become adults, become members of gangs that it's very difficult for them to extricate themselves from them. And, and those prisoners who are really, um, you know, if you like, uh, uh, consciously thinking about the bad things that they do and, 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 uh, and living lives as, um, uh, as in, in a sense, career criminals. Uh, Bishop Richard. Absolutely valid point. I th and I think it, it probably comes back to, well, one of the things it comes back to is the, is the issue of sentencing policy. Um, so, uh, so that, that's one thing, you know, again, one size doesn't fit all. Um, so to what extent does our sentencing policy allow for the recognition of the impact of drug abuse, gang membership, for which there might be huge social pressure, thinking some of the parishes I've would have worked in in the past in South London, huge social pressure to be part of that, that scene. Um, and then again, how do we achieve I'm not providing any answers, I'm just raising questions here. Um, but how do we achieve the best possible rehabilitation and support for somebody um, in prison and then leaving prison not to slip back into the pattern that will just make, you know, produce the revolving door syndrome, uh, that you're just in and out and in and out because you're going back to the same circumstance all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where a place like Chanakalo can break that cycle. Um, I've come across a few prisoners in recent times, very recent times, who said to me, um, the best chance I've got is to find a community um, where there is prayer. Mm. I need, you know, I found my faith in prison. This is going to be my best shot. And I need to put myself in a circumstance and get the support I need. Um, because without that... I'm at risk of, of, of going back onto the drug scene, back into the, the gang scene, whatever it might be. Um, so the, the, the key to this has to be, for me, in um, the, the best possible um, uh, support and obviously sometimes uh, medical treatment too in, in the prison setting, um, but then the support once people have completed their sentence um, 
and, and, and that's going to demand, I think, a lot of resource. I think your question has put his or her finger on a very, very important issue here. Uh, I stumbled across it when I was in prison and I sort of suddenly by mistake kind of became the wing letter writer. And when I started to write letters to my fellow prisoners, often on the most intimate subjects imaginable, I got to know them quite well. And I was absolutely staggered quite early on by the high percentage, the figure is actually about 40%, of those in prison who have spent all or part of their formative years in care. And all of us were probably watching this uh, Zoom tonight have had someone in our lives who said, well done, son, I love you. Awful lot of these guys in prison have never had that. And that's an enormous, not excuse for crime, but it can be an explanation to crime. And then the... Uh, illness of mentally ill people. Um, the, there's a statistic which says 80% of all prisoners have some form of mental illness. Well, that may be quite on the low level of depression, but it certainly goes right up to the high levels of schizophrenia. And a lot of these people shouldn't really be in prison at all. Uh, and that's another big problem. Uh, how can one help? Well, um, Richard, Richard's put his finger on something very, very important, which is, you know, prayer. But I, I, and I'm all in favor of needless to say of um, Christian communities welcoming ex-prisoners. But in, and I think another thing I just mentioned, uh, but nearly a third of all prisoners can't read or write properly. And so how are you going to get a job, for example, if you can't read or write the labels on a uh, tin on a, a wet, in a warehouse. Um, so there are some very, very significant underlying problems to do with um, upbringing, chances, um, education, and prison is a very blunt instrument. You can't really sort these things out. Um, but occasionally, uh, it, it, you'll even get rehabilitated and educated in prison. Okay, thank you. And um, we've got a question here from Gerardo Girardi, uh, who's um, in the Institute of Business Law and Society at St. Mary's University, who says that um, he thinks that the chaplaincy service in prison is wonderful and necessary, but is concerned about how genuine prisoners are in their conversations with chaplains. He says that he knows a prisoner who committed fraud, became a Catholic in prison, never admitted his guilt in his correspondence with his victims, and he regularly corresponds with them. Um, of course, Gerardo continues, one cannot read a prisoner's mind, and I suppose something like this can always happen, but it's worrying. Any comment would be welcome. Are, are, people, are, are prisoners using chaplaincy services, in a sense, instrumentally uh, to, in order to um, uh, uh, make their lives easier in, 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 in prison? How, how genuine are, are they? Uh, Bishop Richard. Well, I, first of all, I think it's, it's obviously, I, it's a useful question. It's it's difficult to answer to 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 go from the particular to the general, and you know there there will always be a case that isn't quite as one would like it to be. Mm -hmm. That's always the case in life. You know, mm -hmm. um, my experience, I have to, and as I said right at the beginning, it's not nearly as doesn't have the depth that Jonathan's has in any sense. But my experience of um, encountering um, men and women. In, in the prison setting is that their engagement with faith is genuine. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My suspect, it may well be the case, uh, I can, in, I could imagine this being the case that somebody might think, well, maybe the chaplain's is offering something on a Tuesday evening. Um, uh, if I sign up for this, it'll get me out of the cell for an hour. Mm -hmm. Well, we've all got to start from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if out of five people who think, well, I'll just go along because it'll be a bit of a change and I'll meet people and chat. Mm -hmm. If out of that five, um, well, on all sorts of levels, they're meeting with other people. It's, it's a different scenario. It doesn't mean that, that they're all going to suddenly become massively gospel greedy or, or convert or whatever. Um, but in a way that doesn't worry me very much you, you know if one person does fantastic mm -hmm. um but it, it, and it comes to, it comes 
I suppose where I'm coming from in, in this, this rather waffly answer is that every person has a dignity that is God-given. And we have to start from that place. Um, and there is therefore in every person the possibility of openness to what is good and what is right. Mm -hmm. um, and what is best and what is of the divine. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in anybody who, who, um, who is, has that experience and, is, and can, be, can be brought to that kind of experience through the chaplaincy work, I don't believe it will ever be lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your question has a point, but uh, not a, as all that strong a point. First of all, it is, of course, true that there's masses of hypocrisy, humbuggery, people being in denial on a prison wing. Absolutely true. Um, uh, but they didn't get much advantage from talking to a chaplain because a good chaplain uh, wasn't born yesterday. And uh, if someone who's they're talking to um, denounces the judge ferociously, accuses the police officers of lying, even when that might conceivably be true, uh, as long as you're sort of angry, resentful and in denial, um, there's not much a chaplain can do except to try. On the other hand, there are plenty of people who actually realise they've hit rock bottom, realise they've failed, and are reaching out uh, in a rather moving, touching way to a chaplain just to talk about um, why they would like to change direction. And that's why, to me, uh, prison ministry is such a thrilling challenge. Uh, I'm happy I've never been in my life. Um, often failing, but, but always trying mm -hmm. to help people to um, accept God's grace, mm -hmm. uh, turn to a new life, rehabilitate themselves. It takes two to tango on that. Uh, but there's uh, wonderful when it happens, and, and any prison chaplain sees it happening pretty regularly, and praying with prisoners is um, a joy to serve in this way. And there's much more good things that happen than mm -hmm. bad things that happen to people who are in angry denial. And how do other prisoners view it? If, if when a prisoner is um, showing an interest in, in the Christian faith and developing a relationship with, um, and perhaps you know, moving to baptism and that type of thing, how do his fellow prisoners tend to view that? Well, a mixture. Strangely, the COVID scene has helped uh, chaplains and chaplains because a lot of people are nervous and scared, but I mean, I remember being shouted at for being a Jesus freak when I was in prison and went to prayer meetings and things like that. Uh, and um, there's a certain amount of leg pulling that goes on. Oh, you're not wasting uh, your time by talking to the pie. That's prison slang, pie and liquor equals vicar uh, in the East End. Uh, but, so there's a certain amount of, so on the whole, fairly good natured joshing. Mm -hmm. Equally, there's a worry that well, maybe sort of Bill the burglar has sort of got something uh, that uh, he's talking to the chaplain about. So it's sort of mixed and um, complicated. Mm -hmm. The chaplain's probably always worth trying. Yeah, OK. And um, just time for one or two more uh, uh, questions. But bef um, before I ask the next question, just to note that uh, in chat we've added... Um, a link to a prayer book for prisoners that's been launched by the Bishop's Conference, a link to the Church of England uh, website on prisons, and also a link to St. Mary's First Star Academy, which is uh, an academy for young people between ages 14 to 18 uh, who are um, in, uh, in care. Uh, and St. Mary's developed that cognizant of the fact that, as, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, a very high proportion of prisoners are children who have been in care and the development of these types of uh, educational opportunities uh, within universities uh, in the United States have been very successful in reducing um, offending amongst um, children who've been in care and for that reason a number of philanthropic supporters supported St Mary's in developing the First Star um, Academy. So um, uh, one more question for, from the uh, audience. Uh, uh, somebody asked about volunteering too because not everybody who comes out of prison is ready for employment and perhaps I could just elaborate on that a little bit so you know, people, uh, there are a large number of employees, perhaps we could just name check Timpson, for example, who have a very high proportion of their employees, including branch managers who are ex-offenders, um, a large number of employees who take on 
um, ex-offenders. Uh, um, but the, the, there may be many um, ex-offenders who were not ready for uh, employment, but highly structured volunteering opportunities might be something which would make them ready for the uh, labour market in, in due course. Um, uh, Bishop Richard, can you tell us something about whether or not that type of thing goes on and, and um, uh, perhaps how Christian charities can, can help develop that? I think that raises a very helpful point because during that time of volunteering, and I'm thinking of um, organisations such as the SVP, for instance, Society of St. Vincent de Paul, um, we have done in, in Brighton a centre run by the SVP. There are a number of, that's just one example, but there would be many opportunities around for volunteering in, in organisations. And during that time of volunteering, um, one would hope that there could be possibilities for, first of all, growth in confidence, because that's a huge thing. If you're coming into the, if you're coming to look at perhaps at the job market, really for the, the perhaps even the first time in your life, um, you know, confidence can be a big issue. You could be, you could, that can be a setting where a circle of support in some form is present. It can be a space during which um, perhaps a little improvement in English and math skills can be acquired if they're needed. Um, so that volunteering can be a wonderful step forward uh, it, on, on the path to employment and open doors to it as well. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I can only, uh, I think the question is very helpful, but it's it, in a sense, it's a statement with which one would not disagree. I think it's, mm -hmm. absolutely, it's, it's, it's a wonderful way forward. Um, and the more possibilities there are for that, the better. We've, we've had uh, in, the, in the diocese here, and I know this would be the case in many instances, um, you know, approaches from um, the, the rehabilitation open prison end of, of the process um, for, for possibilities for, for work placements. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are, there are plenty of opportunities there as well in which, in which our communities can assist. Jonathan? Well, uh, volunteers are hugely welcome, uh, both in prisons, in good prisons at least. We have over 100 volunteers, all Christian denominations in Pentonville, and a lot of them are very, very good indeed. But I think the greatest opportunities, and I think Bishop Richard was hinting at this, is in charities outside the prisons, much easier to enroll for, and much easier to get welcome for. And there are a lot of them. I mean, I'm well aware of the fine works and Vincent Paul Society does. Uh, Lord Longford, who is a great Catholic and prison reformer, uh, the Longford Trust, he formed a charity um, which is well supported. Prison Fellowship is another one. It's quite easy by a bit of Googling to find um, charities in the field of prison uh, ministry and prison rehabilitation, and they all need volunteers. So some of them have quite strong training methods to for you can you can't just walk off in the street but it's a big field wide open so anyone who's thinking about this please please volunteer thank you and that uh, really takes me to my last question which um perhaps i could just ask for maybe a one sentence answer so now in the psalms it's written the lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people and then jesus said in what was a very personal um call to each of us individually I was in prison and you came to visit me. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So um, now perhaps this meant, uh, what can we uh, as individuals um, do to uh, help serve, help those who are in prison? Um, obviously that will depend on our situation, the time commitment we, we can give and all sorts of individual circumstances. Uh, one, one last piece of pastoral advice, perhaps for, everybody who's listening. Jonathan. Well, it's true that the scriptures are full of um, good advice to be followed. And the greatest, of course, I think is probably the parable of the sheep of the goats. But there are plenty of Psalms. There are at least 14 references in the Psalms uh, to prisoners. And one Psalm, Psalm 130, is called the Prisoner's Psalm, largely because Oscar Wilde wrote his prison memoir De Profundis, Out of the Depths, from Psalm 130, is called the Out of the Depths, or an old-fashioned uh, 
version of the Psalms in the De Profundis Psalm. But what could the most practical thing do? I think we've just done in the last question. Apart from praying from prisoners and prison staff too carry heavy burdens, and please occasionally for prison chaplains. But I think in addition to prayer, the most practical steps are in the field of volunteering, which I think we've covered. Bishop Richard. Yes, I'm, I, I would give exactly the same answer. Prayer, volunteering. Don't be frightened to volunteer. I think some people might feel, um, you know, you look at look look at the. The, the prison wall externally, it's pretty daunting. Um, and so, um, but don't, you know, the, so people I don't think need to be as, uh, need to be fearful. Volunteering in the long term is not going to be for everybody, um, but an openness to that possibility. Um, certainly support for, for prison staff as well. And the, the other, um, the other place where volunteering help, outreach, kindness, um, is really important is for um, the, the families of those who are in prison and also for those who've been affected by crime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 there's something here um, for, for every person involved um, in, in the experience of, of, of crime, whatever angle it might be, um, uh, everybody needs support and, and care and time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think time is key. Well, I'm just go back to the COVID thing. One of the things that once heard over the last year or so um, is people saying, gosh, I'm suddenly finding I've got time. Now, how are we using this time? You know, and a little bit of time for others, whether it be, as I've said, the victim of crime, the family of somebody who's currently Fulling, fulfilling their sentence, time for people as they leave, um, time in volunteering in prison or with organisations. Um, it will it 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 will be hu a huge benefit to those to whom one reaches out, and as we've seen, I think in this evening's conversations, massively fulfilling as well. Thank you. Um, well, it's time, it's time to bring things to an end, I, I, I'm afraid. It's been a, a wonderful experience being able to host this event. Uh, just, just to say, we've put in links also to the Timpson Foundation, the St. Vincent de Paul um, Society, and the Prison Fellowship. Uh, um, I, I do hope you've enjoyed the event as much as I have, and I'd like to give a big vote of thanks to our two special guests. There would, I'm sure, be a huge round of applause if this were a Zoom meeting where we could have two-way interaction. Imagine it. <laughs> Or, or, or a public meeting rather than a webinar with one-way um, communication. Um, uh, but if it's just too difficult to do anything else, uh, in, uh, given the circumstances we're in, uh, we can pray for those who are in prison and for those who work and volunteer uh, in our various offender uh, institutions. Uh, I, it's wonderful to hear that, that uh, Bishop Richard, uh, how Bishop Richard describes it as being a deeply satisfying um, role, deeply satisfying vocation um, being a prison chaplain. That satisfaction is deeply um, deserved. So um, good night from me and uh, good night from um, uh, Bishop Richard and Reverend Jonathan. And thank you very much for your participation uh, in this event. Philip, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs>